It's good to be able to see you this morning and to worship the Lord with you all. So um, my name is Mark Mudge, and I am a missionary in Guatemala City and have the opportunity to be able to give a missions report to you all this morning. And so what I'd like to be able to do in this morning is to, to be able to speak about the spiritual war in Ephesians 6 for a few minutes and then to be able to give you a report about how things have gone in the past four months or so since the last time I was here. I was actually here not that long ago. So please be patient with me. I've got a mix of Spanglish going on in my mind, and so sometimes it's hard for me to communicate in a clear, normal way. So please be patient with me this morning in the, the sermon and in the Sunday school, and I'll try and speak in a clear way for you all to, Let's go ahead and open with prayer, and then we'll begin with the update, okay? Let's pray. Lord God, we want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to be here in your day. What a blessing it is. We want to thank you that we're able to worship you in person, and we thank you for this grace. We remember that this is your day, that this is a uh, time set aside to rest one day out of seven, to worship you, to focus on what you desire, to hear your word, to grow in your likeness. Lord God, we pray that you would help us to grow in our understanding of the gospel and what it means to obey you, to live for you. Please help us to exhort one another as we see the day coming. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be able to encourage one another to love and good works in this day. Please help us with our conversations to think about your word and please help us to love you and your people today. We pray for this update that you please would help me to be able to glorify you for the great things you have done. Lord, we pray that you would help us to grow in our service of you. So Lord, please bless this time so that we would be led to worship you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So once more, I'm uh, Mark Mudge, and I used to be a member here with my wife, Ashley, for about 10, 11 years. And we are now missionaries in Guatemala City, Guatemala. And we have about, or we've been there for about five years now, four to five years. And so... Um, what we have is, I'm going to try and work through a slideshow in order to, uh, so we can go with the next slide, brother. We have been in, in Guatemala City for about four to five years now, and we're, this is a picture of our small church in Guatemala City from this, this past year. And so, if, next slide, please. We're in Guatemala, which is just below Mexico. And I'm showing you this map, not because most of you guys know where Guatemala is, but I'm showing you this map because it becomes more helpful later on with some of the report. Guatemala is a country about the size of Tennessee, just below Mexico, and it has a population of about 16 million people, maybe about 4 million in the capital. So it's about the size of Philadelphia and the size of how many people are there. In the center, it's kind of hard to see, south center, there is the capital in a mountain range. And there's some, the, the country is made up of departments, and then, which works out kind of be like counties, about the size of counties here. And so there's some, it's kind of hard to see, but a orangish reddish one um, to the, you see to the right, near the border of Honduras named Sacapa is there's a department which one of the brothers or there's new members from the church are from there. So maybe I'll cut, I thought I was gonna have a clicker to be able to move back and forth, but I'll try and remember this map and it'll become more applicable later on when we talk about members. Okay, if we could go to the next slide, please. So we've been there now since we moved in 2016, September. This is a picture from back then, our very first Sunday. Benjamin and I looked younger back then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And so we're, we're very thankful to be able to have had the grace to be able to be there in these four to five years now. So let's begin to open up the scriptures into Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. We're going to read Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. And so when we consider that we've been there four to five years now, one of the things that's very important is perseverance in the Christian life, perseverance in the ministry. And so the Lord Jesus helps us, guides us on how to persevere in the Christian walk in Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. So I want to be able to begin this update with look, looking at this text and remembering some basics about it. Let's go ahead and read chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. We'll begin, we'll briefly cover this text, and then we'll get into more a detail of report about what's happened the past four months, and then questions, God willing. So Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. The Word of God says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation the sword, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. In this text, we can kind of see three clear divisions. In verses 10 to 13, we have an introduction to the spiritual war. In verses 14 to 17, we have a practical explanation of how to put on the armor of God. And then in verses 18 to 20, we conclude with the spiritual war with the importance of prayer and the preaching of the gospel. And so Paul begins this section with finally my brethren, and he's beginning to bring the, the epistle to a close. He's explained three chapters focused in on the doctrine of salvation and union with Christ, the doctrines of the grace of God revealed in the election of the saints, in his prayers for us to know Christ, in him giving us new life in Christ, how the church is reconciled with Christ and with one another. He's explained about the wonderful mystery of being able to, of preaching the gospel to all the nations and how the gospel and union with Christ is evidenced by a clear and distinct sanctification union in the body of Christ serving one another in the, in the local church and a definitive growth that's seen in the family seen at work seen in marriage seen in raising children and so then we, we get this last part in the, in the book of Ephesians. And in verses 10 to 13, we have an introduction into the spiritual war. Introduction to the spiritual war. So spiritual war, when we say we use war, it's a conflict. There's a great conflict and there's a great goal. There's a great enemy. When we have a conflict, it means that we have a conflict against Satan. And the spiritual forces, they're at work. And we have, but we have a great goal. War always has a good goal, is to have a goal, good goal. It's the, a just war. 
And so the goal in this war is the glory of Jesus Christ. The glory of Jesus Christ through the preaching of the gospel, the salvation of souls, and the perseverance of the saints. So this is a very clear and distinct goal that we want to glorify Christ and enjoy him forever. But we have great opposition. So we must be very clear that our goal is to preach the gospel to the lost and to preach the the word of God to the saints so that we would persevere in the faith. And so then we have an instruction here on how to do that in verses 10 to 13, an introduction to that. So he begins this last theme in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in, and in the, the, the power of his might. So he focuses on us being strong, our responsibility, and yet we're strong by dependence on the Lord. And so we see that when we're weak, then we're strong. When we're admitting our need for the Lord and his power and his, the work to be done by his strength by his grace that's when we're actually strong and so then we have a practical exhortation verse 11 put on the whole armor of god that's how we're going to be able to be strong and then we have the purpose in in verse 11 that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil the devil wants to work with all kinds of lies lies in the world lies in systems of religion lies in uh, philosophies of thought, ways that are c- common to com- be, uh, way, co- some common ways to communicate that you see in the TV, in social media, that you hear at work, you hear in school, that's evident in verse 12 that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness, the heavenly places. We have four terms describing demonic powers here. Not in such a detail that we can organize and and have a, a clear structure, but in a general way to know that they're organized and they're prepared in this spiritual war in order to pump out their lies. And the world is gonna drink in all the lies these demonic lies, and this is really what's behind philosophies that are common in our country and in churches that are false churches, sadly. And so we see, we, this is how we, well, how we wrestle. It's a spiritual warfare. It's a truth war. And so in verse 13, we have the, the call again to take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So here we see that focus once again on withstanding, standing firm. You get the image of someone on the, the wall of a castle, having to defend against the, the hordes that are attacking and trying to overcome the castle. And so how do we do that then? If we have this introduction in verses 10 to 13, the big picture the big view. Then we have verses 14 to 17 to describe how to do that. How do we continue to war in the spiritual war? How do we battle? Well, stand therefore in verse 14, having girded your waist with truth. And so that we'd be going to go through the particulars of the armor of God. So when we consider the armor of God, there is a cultural background but there's also an Old Testament background. There's a cultural background, but there's also an Old Testament background. And you've got to understand both. A lot of preachers in this text will focus on the cultural background and how a Roman soldier was dressed and have maybe a picture of a Roman soldier. But it's important to remember that there's an Old Testament background to this. In the book of Isaiah, it describes the Messiah as being, having these same pieces of armor. And that it's really his armor that when we look at it and we look on the inside of the shield, it's got Jesus Christ's name on it. And that, that helps us to understand to be able how to apply these things. That the armor of God is not simply meditating on the gospel. And it's not simply living practical obedience in a practical steps. 
It's actually both. It's actually meditating on the truths of the gospel and applying those truths in your life. And you remember how that's the way the New Testament communicates about how to grow in the Christian life. Like in the book of Titus, where it describes, repeats good works, good works, good works, good works throughout the book of Titus. But it's all connected back to the gospel. And our union with Christ, our dependence on him, that we actually grow by understanding the gospel better and growing in Christ's likeness. And so we, we see that those two, those two things are not two different decisions, but really they're both uh, applied. Meditating on the truths of the gospel, how Christ wore this armor in fulfillment with the prophecies of Isaiah. And that it leads us to wear the armor. It, guide, it teaches us that we need to wear Christ's armor. And so as we meditate on the gospel and we grow in the understanding of how Christ, everything he said was truth. And he was a truth incarnate. And as we meditate on that and his integrity and his truthfulness, it leads us as Christians to speak the truth and to have integrity to live in a way that's truthful. And we have the belt of truth. So if you want to learn more about that, there's a little book by Brian Borgman and Robin Ventura called The Spiritual Warfare. And it's an exposition of these, these verses. Very clear, very good explanation of the historical background, but also the Old Testament background to this text that helps us understand that it is, the way to apply it is, is truly meditating on the gospel and applying it in a practical way, both of those things. And so we have this instruction of how to do that with all the different pieces of armor, meditating on the righteousness of Christ and then living in a righteous way that, is, that it completely fits with that, um, a true understanding of the righteousness of Christ imputed to us leads us to live righteously. In verse 15, we remember how Christ won our peace for us. And how that leads us to have the gospel of peace ready on our lips. In verse 16, where we take the shield of faith. And we're able to trust the Lord with all, during all the lies of the evil one. In verse 17, the helmet of salvation that Christ has won. And that assures us and gives us an assurance of our salvation. And we use the sword of the spirit. And then lastly, we see in verses 18 to 20 the importance of prayer and preaching the gospel in the spiritual war. So why do we begin here? Well, it's good to begin with the scripture. We focus on the Lord, but it's also a key description of, of how we're to persevere, for how to persevere here in Orlando and how we want to persevere in Guatemala, continuing to grow in our understanding of the gospel and applying it and look at how loving our good shepherd is to be able to guide us on how to persevere. Not just to begin in the Christian life, but to be able to persevere to the end in a very, very clear, practical way for a great goal to glorify Christ and enjoy him forever by preaching the gospel to the lost and teaching the word of God for the perseverance of the saints. So that's what we're trying to do in Guatemala. It's the same thing. And so let's begin to close this part where we, we have an opening with the scripture and begin to get a report about the things that have happened the past four months. So I'm going to explain it using some pictures, some of what we've been teaching, some ministry opportunities, some of testimonies of how the Lord has saved people. And then we we'll hope to end with some prayer requests, and some questions. So now we'll, um, some of the things that we're teaching, we're going through, we finished the book of Ephesians since the last time I was here, and it took us about two years to go through the book of Ephesians, and now we're beginning the book of Habakkuk. We've gone about seven weeks into Habakkuk, and we're going to study Habakkuk today. 
uh, overview. I'm going to try and preach seven sermons to you guys in one hour. We'll see how it works. <laughs> in the book of Ephesians, it's been a great blessing to us to in our in Iglesia and Torcha, Torcha to be able to study about how the gospel is key for our spiritual growth in understanding. So we had a year of chapters one to three studying the riches that we have in Christ, and then we had a, a year studying chapters four to six on how to grow in obedience to Jesus Christ and glorifying him. So we can really see the centrality of Jesus Christ in the gospel. In Habakkuk, it's the same. We're learning how to trust the Lord and how to have wrestle, how to str have the struggle of faith, how to wrestle with learning to trust God and have a respectful questioning of certain times in certain trials, but not an accusing of God and how we need to be able to grow in the faith. And so we've been studying those things. Next slide, please. Some ministry opportunities we've had. We've had some opportunities to, I've had an opportunity to be on the radio in Bolivia. That's on the, on the right side. That was definitely a different experience to be on the radio. And, but in that opportunity, it was an opportunity to speak about missions. And the goal of those times was to be able to glorify Christ. So I want to begin to talk about missions, but I also want to be able to preach the gospel in a brief, clear way, but then also be able to describe how is a, what's a biblical way to think about missions. Particularly, a great emphasis is focus on the local church and how missions should be focused in on the local church, being missionaries sent from local churches. A great, there's a great problem in many, with many missionaries that they don't really understand what it means to be called to the ministry. They, a lot of people just think about, well, if I have the desire to be a missionary, then I should go and be a missionary. And they don't think about being sent from the local church and the blessing it is to be able to be affirmed in your calling by the means that God has given, including the local church. And so I had the opportunity to speak about missions and be able to make some of those emphases uh, in a biblical perspective of, what it, of how to do the work of the ministry. And also, be, once you get there on the, in the mission field, being f focusing the work in on the local church. Many missionaries in Latin America, they, they go and they move there and they have a, a sort of parachurch ministry that is not submitted to a local church. So there's many missionaries that don't even go to church and they're off in another country, maybe teaching the, the true gospel, maybe they're having Bible studies, but it's very common, it's very common that they're not actually submitting to a local church in the country that they live. So... The goal was just to glorify Christ, but preach the gospel, but also talk about a biblical view of missions and that opportunity. On the left side is a little flyer about a, in a pastor's Bible study from some pastors from Honduras. So Honduras is a neighboring country, and I know a, a, a pastor there, uh, and some of the other pastors know Manuel Sheran. So that was with a, the church called Estandarte uh, de Verdad, which is Banner of Truth, Banner of Truth Reformed Baptist Church. So we... The pastor there has a, a Bible study with other pastors who are wanting to reform and learn about, there tend to be Pentecostals, a group of Pentecostal pastors who are wanting to learn about biblical doctrine. So in that opportunity, what, we taught, what I taught about was discipleship. He, a the, he asked me to be able to teach about that. So a big problem with discipleship is understanding what it means to be a disciple. So I know that you guys are studying this uh, once again in small group, right? What is a biblical disciple? That a Christian is a disciple, a disciple is a Christian. And that you have great problems when you lose that, that truth. You, people go to hell when, when you don't understand that a disciple is a Christian and a Christian is a disciple. And so I wanted to make that point clear because in Latin America that's not, that's not clear that's a great confusion about that, like there is here. In, there's a lot of legalistic churches that have various levels to the Christian life. And so they think a lot, a lot of Pentecostal churches teach in Latin America. They, they teach about you reach another level 
of when you get baptized or when you become more dedicated. And, they, and some churches have a lot of levels. It gets complex. It's not simply carnal Christians and dedicated Christians. It's, it's more like a, a, a ladder system with some of these Pentecostal churches. So because the, the pastors are coming out of Pentecostalism, that was a big goal to make it clear that a Christian is a disciple and a disciple is a Christian. But then to also apply that biblical perspective of conversion to ministry in the church. That, that leads us to have a biblical understanding of what it means to disciple in the church. And that we should be ch a church full of disciples who make disciples. So it leads to a healthy philosophy of ministry as well. Something that the pastors needed as well. So those were uh, opportunities to be able to, uh, to teach. Next slide, please, brother. Other opportunities, there's two brothers here, one named Dennis and one named Jair, that I'm trying to disciple. And so it's encouraging to have some godly brothers who are zealous, that want to work in the ministry, that want to teach, they want to preach, they want to evangelize and serve the Lord. So two of those brothers are relatively new. They've both been in the church less than, <coughs> than two years, or two years or less. So here's a, uh, what we're doing on Wednesday mornings is we're going through the 1689. So one brother, uh, Dennis, in the middle, he was saved in Canada and, in a, and grew in the faith in a church called Grace Life that has a pastor named uh, James Coates. Coates, James Coates, who was recently released from jail. So it's a small world. The church is not that big. It's about the size of Cornerstone. And so he attended that church or was a member of that church for about four years, three, four years. So he has a good foundation of understanding of the Bible, conversion. And Jair is a good brother who's, uh, I've mentioned him before, but a great encouragement he is to the church. How Lee says he, he helped change the culture of Antorcha, in particularly giving us a great... Uh, amount of uh, encouragement to love one another, sacrifice, evangelize. And so they're both very zealous brothers. And so we're studying the 1689 because the goal is to help give them a basic understanding of systematic theology through the 1689. So understanding doctrine in a systematic way. So that's something that's very needed in Latin America is a clear systematic theology. So next slide, please, brother. So in this, we're praying in the dark here, but <laughs> here's our, our weekly Bible study. We don't really pray in the dark. That's a joke. <laughs> but what we're, what it's a picture of is that we're studying the, the book of Revelation and we're, we have a midweek service where we're, we, we pray and we're studying Revelation verse by verse. What's, what's been encouraging for the people is that they've mentioned how learning and studying verse by book in the book of Revelation is it's more clear and more clear each week. Thank you, brother. And that they, what they really see is that it is, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a book that really reveals Christ, not conceals Christ. And so truly understood that it really guides us in the spiritual war to see the lies of the devil and the, the spiritual truths that apply to the church. So that's been a great blessing. We're right now in chapter 7. So I will recommend Pastor Rick's sermons that he preached a few years ago for you all to listen to, to remember some of those things. Can we go to the next slide, please, please brother? This morning, the brother that was in uh, um, Jair, who was on the far right of the three of the picture with the three of us, he is teaching the Sunday school in which is holiness, holiness by J.C. J.C. Ryle. We're going through that that book about a biblical view of sanctification. So today he's teaching the lesson about Lot, about how, how Lot was a righteous man. Second Peter says, but he was not an example for us, sadly in his compromise. And so there's a lot of clear instruction in that chapter in that book about how to make decisions in life 
where you don't make them based on what's going to get you more money, what's going to be better for the moment. And we don't want to be like Lot and make decisions that are based on this life. We want to be pilgrims who are passing through. So we learn about how to be holy. So uh, the brothers are very encouraged by this study on what is true holiness. There's a lot of misunderstanding about holiness in Latin America. With all the legalism in Pentecostal churches, holiness is often thought of as a very outward thing. How you dress, how you talk, what you do on Sunday, but not true biblical holiness that's evident in the heart sanctification and a thought life. So this study has been a blessing. The people in the church have mentioned that it's been a blessing to help with their assurance of salvation. They have a true biblical assurance. There's a chapter in that book on assurance. I'm not teaching that class. Lee and the other brother, Jair, are teaching that class. Next slide, please, brother. So this is actually an example of essentials class. I am teaching essentials class. And what we have here is a couple who is, lives four hours north of the capital. And they are participating in everything they can online, Thursday night, midweek, and, and Sunday morning. They are participating in the essentials class, mostly by means of Zoom. But they have traveled to visit us. And so they were living together for about seven years, if I remember correctly. And so through the essentials class, they said that we've learned the true gospel and that we want to follow Christ. We don't want to follow him in a uh, sort of a light um, evangelical or light gospel kind of way. So, they, so here they're getting legally married. Uh, and it's part of their desire to follow the Lord. They've expressed the desire to try and attend as much as possible from four hours away. So it's named, um, Eric is the, the, the guy on the left and Alejandra on the right. And so I encourage them. Um, they both want, said they want to follow the Lord. So I encourage them to follow the Lord together and be, be married. And so that's our representative of the essentials of class. Next slide, please, brother. So here we have a picture of an evangelism group. We, this was a trip to one of the counties or departments off to the northeast, Sacapa. There, it's kind of like Arizona. Um, it's very dry and hot. But in the capital, it's, it's great weather, some of the best weather in the world. Hawaii is the only place that I like the weather better than, than Guatemala City. But in Sacapa, it's pretty hot, and there's no AC because there's uh, very little AC. So Cassandra had a hard time there. <laughs> she, she. But uh, we went there to be able to have an evangelism time, and that's where the brother who was saved in Canada, that's where him, he's living with his wife, and they travel every other Sunday. So it's about three hours away to church. And so we had a church uh, trip to go out there and evangelize. So we're continuing to preach in the open air. We're continuing. There's a little note on the left, zone 15, and that's where the church is located. So we're continuing to evangelize around the church. So we've had many opportunities to evangelism. A couple stories. The brother on the far right corner, Jair, I mentioned him with the thumbs up. He's preached the gospel to some people at work, and so he's invited a guy named Louis and Wilfredo. And so there are people who are in a sinful lifestyle of drugs and things like that. So we spent a night together preaching the gospel to them, trying to explain to them that, uh, that, these, that their lifestyle shows that they're not Christians. And so one of the young guys, his name Wilfredo, he was convinced he's a Christian because he grew up in the church and his, pa and his parents were pastors and then he became a youth pastor and then he left the church and lived in sin and been living in sin for the past six years. And so he was just completely convinced that he was, had just lost his salvation. He was still a kind of a Christian. If he died, he knew he'd go to hell, but he would still think he was a Christian. So it's part of the Pentecostal teaching uh, that is very common there about you can lose your salvation. So because most people are Pentecostals or Catholics, 
both of those groups teach you can lose your salvation. So it's very rare to meet people who don't think that you can, um, that salvation is secure in Christ. Or maybe I'll say that in a different way. Most people think you can lose your salvation. So, so that's an example of some current evangelism that's been going on. Next slide, please, brother. This is our new location we're headed to. God willing, we're going to move to a school. <coughs> Excuse me. The week I get back, I'm actually not there to help with a move. This is our last Sunday. Today is our last Sunday. So I asked Lee before we, we, we planned this trip, is it okay if you do all the work for the move? <laughs> <laughs> he, has a good, he had a good attitude about it. So the, the picture on the left is outside just through those double doors on the picture on the right. And so we're, there's a, we're going to be able to rent at, with a 40% cut in rental costs. Yeah, so the Lord has provided for us in this big answer to prayer. Also there, there's also a balance between finding a place that's also relatively secure. So you can get places that are, uh, have a good price, but then it's in a rough area of town. And so then people are worried and thinking about their car being stolen while they're in church. And then it gets to be a complicated thing. So it's really nice to be able to find a place where they can park their car within the property and not have to worry about it being stolen and, and be able to worship the Lord uh, without thinking about those things. And so this is actually a school that Ashley's family runs. So we're thanking the Lord. We're very thankful for the opportunity to move. We've had many ministry opportunities, studying through the, the books of Ephesians, Habakkuk, opportunities in radio uh, to serve other pastors, opportunities in discipleship, teaching the book of Revelation, studying the, the book of holiness by J.C. Ryle. We've had many evangelism opportunities. We're moving this next Sunday, God willing. And next slide, please. And so some challenges. I know recently I, I was thinking about the way that I give updates here. And that, you know, I only talk about good things is, is one thing I, I, I noted. and never talk about some of the difficult things. So difficulties, what's been going on in difficulties? Uh, one is a difficulty here that, you, that many of you know and many of you have been loving that are that my father-in-law is very sick, and so with liver disease, and so I want to be, I'm very thankful to you all for going and preaching the gospel to my father-in-law, and so purpose of this trip, why we're here just after four, visiting you all four months ago, is really to spend time with him uh, because of his health condition. So thank you for your prayers for him. He participated in a Bible study uh, last Thursday night, so I was teaching through Zoom I had a Bible study in Guatemala, and it was about sinners in the hands of an angry God. And so it was an appropriate study for, for him, and I was very thankful because normally he, he's not, he doesn't participate in Bible studies or co like to come to church. Or, so I was very thankful for him. And it was all in Spanish, so it was, I think, clear for him. He's speaking English well, but it's even clearer maybe in, in his first language. So those are some of the, the difficulties. Some of the, in the church, some of the difficulties are, are working through COVID issues, trying to help people think through the importance of taking wise, calculated risks and saying, yeah, you, you can't guarantee your health. You can't guarantee your safety in driving to church either can't guarantee your safety in many other things. And so we don't take unwise risks. We take calculated risks, but we still have to take risks in order to follow the Lord. So trying to encourage people to have a, bit, a wise understanding of how we follow the Lord and obey the Lord and trust him, and that we have to have a, a trust that leads us to having a valor or a brave, to be brave in order to be able to do that in these times. So it's the same thing in Guatemala with trying to encourage the people. Same thing, with we have the same issues with COVID. People afraid about those things and, and some government overreach in their, their laws. And we have a lot of the same 
difficulties there with COVID. And so uh, we've also dealt with some members that seem to be moving on, moving, uh, and it may be in church discipline or it may be leaving uh, the church with their membership. I'm not sure yet, but that's a process that's going on right now. So that's some of the difficulties that are going on in the local church. And, and that partic particular issue that's being worked through in the church with a potential church discipline is, is really focused on not attending um, for a long time and not really participating. It's not just not attending. It was not um, being part of the church body. Really, you can't be a part of the church if you're not part of the church, Right. So it's a, it's a contradiction to say I'm a member but not attend and not communicate and not love and not serve as a member and obey the, the basic parts of being a member. So those are some of the difficulties that we've been going through. And next slide, please, brother. So now we have the opportunity to be able to talk about some testimonies. So I have some testimonies here. And I'm not sure I'll be able to get through a, one or two to be able to tell you a story. We have a couple here, Dennis and Janet. Uh, Dennis and Janet are only been married about a year. And the Lord saved Dennis about four years ago in Canada. And the Lord recently saved Janet just a few years ago as well. And they've been married they were married just before COVID began. So I'm going to try and tell you Dennis's testimony, describing in a loose translation in his, from his own, his own words, okay? So you can kind of look at him and li listen to his own word, as I describe him in a third person, though. So Dennis um, grew up in a Christian background, but in actuality, he hated God. He didn't ex um, hate God with clearly expressing his words, but more in his actions. Ever since he could remember, his grandmother would take him to church. And he always believed in the cross, but never really understood the cross of Jesus Christ. He was taught to repeat the sinner's prayer when he was convicted, but he never really truly understood true repentance. Whenever he felt convicted about a sin, he would invite Jesus to his heart again and whenever he felt that God wasn't with him, he would try and repeat the sinner's prayer. But his life was full of conflicts in his family, with his friends, because of his pride. His life was, folk, was filled with self-love. His idol was himself. He would spend hours and hours in front of the te television, addicted to video games. He truly loved those things more than God. He was prideful about how he could lie and deceive others. And he would um, s congratulate himself on his skill in being able to do that. He would constantly think that he was better than others. He was full of bitterness with members of his family and had conflicts with them, many conflicts with them. He would constantly look at many evil things and delight in them and delight in sin. He was completely lost, without salvation, destined for the wrath of God. And he decided uh, to not think about God whenever he felt conviction in, about these things or frustration. Or, and he ignored the word of God. He was in great need, but he didn't look for God and didn't know the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. All he knew was a mediocre gospel that left him feeling empty and miserable. In the year 2012, God in his grace allowed him to move to Canada, in Alberta, Canada. A couple years after that, 2014, he began to hear online, he heard a video from John Piper entitled, You Will Suffer. After hearing that video, he began to think about his soul, began to attend Pentecostal church, and began to read the Bible. He could see some things in, in the Pentecost church were not right, but in the end, he didn't think it was that important. So as time went on, later he heard a, a video from Paul Washer on the true gospel, and he really did not like it. 
He reacted sinfully. He, re um, he rejected what he heard. He rejected the doctrines of grace. And he felt very discouraged after being confronted. And he didn't know exactly what to do and how to respond. He felt lost from hearing the sermon. And his life was a disaster. By the, in the time of November of 2016, he once again heard another sermon from Paul Washer called the Ten Indictments Against the Modern Church. And each word pierced him to the heart. For the first time, he understood the, the biblical gospel, what Christ had done, the cross of Calvary, and how Christ took his sins upon him and suffered the wrath of God in his place. And so, like 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says that for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Since that time, God has been working in Dennis's life, transforming him to be more and more like Jesus Christ. And in Dennis's testimony, he quotes the, the same chapter, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, creation. All th old things have passed away, Behold, all things have become new. Dennis no longer feels the same joy and pleasure in sin that he once loved. He began, he, his life began to change, including the way he, that he spoke to his parents and treated them with much, with much more respect. And the way that he would treat others in general began to change. He stopped laughing at sin. He stopped swearing and he lost his desire to watch so much TV. He instead prefers to read the Bible and listen to biblical sermons. And he stopped being so focused on himself and one began to be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants to leave his pride behind. Now he desires to be close to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit and give his life in service to the Lord. Whenever he has the opportunity, he desires to preach the gospel his co-workers, his family, his friends. So thanks to the grace of God, he is not the person that he was before. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for his work and the life of Dennis. So I want to tell you another story of his wife, Janet. So... Janet grew up in, in Guatemala, in the countryside of Guatemala. And she grew up in a Catholic home that was very dysfunctional. And she grew up with a lot of hate in her heart, wrath, and a thirst for vengeance against those who had hurt her. And so all of this created many problems in her home. Her father frequently abused her mother and, and the, the, the siblings and the family. And when she would see this, this really affected her. She grew up hating and at the same time loving her father. She grew up in a nominal Catholic home, but she really doubted a lot of the things that they did, the worship through the use of images. And so she didn't really consider herself a genuine Catholic. But through all this anger and bitterness of growing up this way in the home, she would often have the desire to take her own life out of the frustration and desperation of living in a home like that. She knew that God existed, but she really didn't look for God. One night, she had the opportunity to go to an evangelistic campaign or an evangelistic rally and the people in the Pentecostal church uh, preached a, a Revelation 3.20 about God, Christ knocking at the door of your heart. And so looking for hope, she walked the aisle and repeated the, the sinner's prayer and asked Jesus into her heart. And she thought this would be the solution to her problems. 
if she repeated this prayer. But the problems continued as the years went by. As she went to the, to the Pentecostal church now, uh, she began to try and find the solution in more rigorous good works. So she would often fast, pray, and participate in all-night prayer vigils. To, and hoping that through these all-night prayer vigils, God would give her what she wanted. They never really preached about sin in this church. And the church is that she was in a, um, in a oneness Pentecostal church. So if you know T.D. Jakes, and uh, it, they deny the, the Trinity, and they also teach a works-based salvation. And so they baptized her, teaching that she couldn't be saved until she was baptized, and that she couldn't go to heaven without receiving the, what they call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so this all led to her having a constant worry about her soul and having no security of salvation. In 2016, she met her husband. And she began to understand through him uh, many of the things that she had doubts about in the Pentecostal church. And she learned about how to dance and dancing in the spirit, speaking in tongues, and slaying people in the spirit was, is all not biblical. He helped her understand that you shouldn't not supposed to yell when you pray. And if, if you've been in those circles, you maybe understand some of those things. And he began to introduce her to preaching from Paul Washer. And so through those sermons, she began to see the difference between the true gospel and the false gospel and understand the false teachings of the, the oneness Pentecostalism. She began to learn the doctrines of grace, sound doctrine. And she learned that her salvation was not based on what she could do, but what Christ did on the cross. Amen. And God in his sovereign mercy helped her to understand who Christ was, who she was in her sin. That Christ was sent by God the Father to take all the wrath that she deserves and suffered in her place washing her of all her sin. And God, her sovereign creator, gave her the faith and the ability to trust in Christ as her Savior and Lord. Even though she, she knows she deserves God's wrath as a miserable sinner, she rejoices in God, the salvation that Christ has offered. She began to confront the church where she was at when she would begin to learn more of the, uh, the gospel and to be genuinely converted. But they responded by not allowing her to attend. They have a phrase about taking away privileges. That's a, a common, um, you don't have privileges in the church. It's a common Pentecostal way to, uh, it's like a half discipline. It's kind of a weird thing. But maybe some of you kind of understand that better than me experientially, even. And so they no longer considered her to be a Christian. And, um, but she knows that the Lord has saved her and allowed her to know more of him and to serve him, to worship him, and to give her life in his service. She doesn't have the same hatred and bitterness and thirst for vengeance as she once had. And now she's learning to pray to God and depend upon him in those times of, of difficulty and learning to grow in the struggle to trust the Lord. And so she's certain of God's work in her life, and she's forgetting her past life each more and more daily and learning to grow in forgiveness. And so we, we're just going to be able to give two testimonies today in the update that hopefully you guys are, are receiving emails and updates. There's another testimony that's... If you could switch the slide, brother. There's an, another family... Uh, and there's a testimony of a brother named Juan on the left. That's very clear, very encouraging, and I hope you, you are getting those email updates. If you're not, please talk to my wife. Just give her a piece of paper with your email, and she can add your email. To, and also, we hope to be able to have those updates on the app um, in time.
But there's a very encouraging, clear testimony. Um, I have a. I would like to be able to someday tell you uh, his wife's testimony as well, but for a different time. So those are some of the things the Lord has been doing in the past four months. Uh, we tell those testimonies because they were. Uh, the, these are new members of the church, and since it, we've last visited you, they've uh, been baptized and are members of Iglesia and Torcha. So what's coming up in this next month, we're going to have a missionary team coming from Cornerstone to be able to preach in a mini-conference, and Ryan's going to lead that trip, and we're excited about that. We're going to hopefully finish the book of Habakkuk within a few weeks, maybe hopefully seven weeks or so, and then we're going to begin the book of Genesis, which should be a, a nice long study. <laughs> We're also going to study Pilgrim's Progress this year. So I hope that that would be edifying for the, the church. If you'd like to continue to pray for us and to continue to know what's going on, please connect with my wife, beautiful lady in the back, with her hand up. Give her your email so that you can receive those updates. So ways to pray for us, please praise God for his saving work. Praise God for adding to his church. Please pray for God to raise up future leaders in the church and future pastors to serve with me. Please pray that God would raise up future church plants. People are traveling from four hours to three hours, various families. So we really need church plants in these various places. So part of the trip in the next few weeks is to visit one of those cities a, f uh, a few hours out and evangelize there. And we pray that that would be perhaps the beginning of a church plant. And so please pray that, that God will give us the grace to persevere in the spiritual war, like we talked about in Ephesians 6. Okay, so I talked a little too long, guys. Sorry. Uh, if you have questions, I'm going to be available all day, so you can ask me questions uh, in person. Okay? Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, we want to thank you and praise you for the great things you're doing. Thank you for being at work in your true churches all over the wor world. Thank you that we can be, have lives focused on you and glorifying you and not lives focused on selfishness and our own desires. Thank you for saving us from our own idolatry. Thank you for leading us to worship you and giving us, taking on our hearts of stone, giving us hearts of flesh and the eyes to see and understand the gospel and trust in you, repent of our sins. Thank you, Lord, for doing that in, our, in Iglesia Antorcha. Thank you for doing that here. Thank you for giving us this day to worship you. So please be glorified in your worship service. Amen.